you know, he makes a bold statement. You know, he said, when I started, when I created everything, he didn't have nobody to help him. Nobody did it. He did it all by himself. And yet, somewhere we forgot just how powerful God is, that he didn't need our help when he first started stuff. He never came down and consulted with anybody. And that, matter of fact, the Bible says he didn't even consult with, even with angels in creation. He counseled with his own will. So everything that we see in creation came from God's own thinking. That's why it's impossible for man to know his mind unless God reveals it to him. Because before we ever had a mind, God was a mind. So it's kind of hard for us to be made in his image. And I'm not just talking about skin-wise and all that. I'm talking about when God talks about making you in his image. God is a spirit, so we know to be made in your image, he's got to connect spiritually with you. And the real image he wants to make in you is a spirit man. That's why the Bible talks about the new man that he created in you. That's after his image. This image you see right here when you look in the mirror, that's after the first Adam's image. <laughs> okay. And, now all, uh, and, and you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out, no matter what you do about this image that you see, every day this thing is getting worse and worse. It's aging. I'm so mad at time right now. I'm getting upset with it because it's not treating me right. <laughs> all of a sudden, I, I begin to feel time. I used to didn't feel time, but now I feel time. But so God did not need our help to do anything as far as creating the world and all the worlds and even the worlds we haven't seen. is even beyond what my eyes can see and even the little intricate details that God done just in earth alone. I, I'm still amazed just with the little stuff here on earth that I've just been able to kind of like discover. And I'm still discovering new things all the time. The brilliancy of God's mind. So when I read the Bible, I try to read the Bible from the standpoint. See, there has to be a real God. Sometimes we have a mental acceptance that there is God. But how real is, is, is he? Can he, does he really have control of the things he created? Does he really own all this? Can God really control all this? Because, see, once I started making God like me, which is always a problem, because a lot of people were like the Jewish people, their mistake was they thought God was like them. And so they constantly tried to make God become like them. And the only fault with that is that God was never like them. And you're not going to believe this either. He ain't like us either. All right? So, you know, you know, the change has to come that we need and necessary to have has to come from him because only he knows how he looks. Only he knows what he wants to see in you. I don't. I have no idea. Because what God says is this, that when he created everything, he created it all with a purpose. And, you know, it would be like the little young girl that was in the house of, uh, of uh, what's the guy that got... Uh, Dipped in the water seven times. Na uh, Naaman, yeah, Naaman. I, I will go call him Nabal. But there was a girl that was a servant in his household. No name was given, but she was there for a purpose. 
a lot of times is that we, because of how we have glorified a lot of things, we make people feel like, well, i got to do something really great for God. The only great thing you do for God is be in his purpose. And if you be in his purpose, you're going to have great things to happen to you in your life. Because I believe there is a place where God desires for us to be. Not a flesh place, but a spiritual place. That's the why now is that most people, when they talk about, well, can't wait to him for God to come back. See, they expect God to come back and do what he done the first time he came, but he came as a lamb. This time he's coming back as your God. So he's not trying to build a literal nothing. Everything he does, that first thing was not spiritual, but it was natural. Second thing is spiritual. So the kingdom that God has us in that we need to recognize is that it is a spiritual kingdom. See, see, you can't see love, joy, peace. I mean, it's not something you can just go in and say, oh, oh there's peace. Huh? There. No. But it's an internal thing, spiritual thing. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words, it's not all them sacrifices that they used to do. Not meat and drink. That should be meat and drink offerings. It's not any of that anymore. But it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And most people who will have the Holy Ghost will never discover the true righteousness, the true peace, and the true joy of God is because we're trying to get the kingdom of God to fit our own perspective. You know, uh, you know, first thing people say, well, if God is in control, why are these things happening? And they will turn around and say, well, God gave us our own free will. And we just never are certain about God. Exactly what is he up to? <laughs> I told a man the other day, because we were talking on the phone, I I, he said, well, what, what do you think? What did he say? Something about I need to do something for God. I said, if he told you what to do, would you do it? Now, <laughs> you know, there's some things in the Bible, see, things are here. They ain't just like, I, I wish it was so that you could read down point one, point two, Point three, but it's not like that. You got to go through the whole book, and you may have something hid in a sentence that you'll miss because you got tired of reading all the begats and all that, and one little thing, and that was what you should have got, and somehow God clouded it all up with stuff that just totally got you off. But if He would tell us, what we needed to do, would we do it? But it's not, it's not unnatural for people of God to not do what God want them to do. I mean, he told them coming out of Egypt, I'm going to give you a land that flows with milk and honey. Took them to it. Guess what? Don't want it. Now, there are no B options in God. You know what I'm saying? It, we almost act like, well, <laughs> I see what God wants me to have, but I am not going to go. I'm going to go ahead and stay where I am, and he's going to have to bless me where I am. And that's just about how sane we are today is that if he told you, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will what? Now, does that sound like God is looking for you to fill out an employment form to go to work for him? That's the problem. Because when you work for him, you usually take his place. He don't need you to work for him. He needs you to allow him to work through you. There's a big difference in him working through you and you working for him. 
Now, I've had bosses on the job that sent me out to do a job for them. I couldn't do it like the boss did. <laughs> so the boss got mad because I didn't do the job like he would do it. But he did send me to do the job for him. There's a big difference if God would have called you to do a job for him, but he didn't call you to do a job for him. Why would he call you to do a job for him when he done done the whole work for you? What, what are you going to add to what he done? What can you add to the salvation that God gave? Free. Free, free, free. <laughs> How can you add to that? You can't add to his sacrifice. You know why? It was perfect. You can't add to his blood. You know why? It's perfect. Everything about what he done for you is perfect. So my first reaction to my salvation is to, as I told Sister Pope earlier, is that I need to discover just how saved I am. How much salvation did I get when I got saved? Because some people didn't get a whole lot, or they don't think they did, but they did. Because Jesus only had one kind. He ain't got, we may have a thousand denominations, but he ain't got but one salvation that I can take. We may have all kind of doctrine, but there ain't but one salvation because there ain't but one Savior. And if he doesn't save, you can't be saved. So we, we, we got to begin to look at the scriptures. First of all, get everything in line. You know, uh, you know some people want to jump way out here and start claiming the world. They want to pull down thrones. and They want to upset the kingdom of the devil and all kind of stuff, and they ain't done the first step yet. They want to claim the riches. They want to claim wealth. I, I get these things on a... On my Facebook page, they say, well, uh, here's all this money that can be yours. All you got to do is type amen. I wish it was that simple. I wish it was that simple. I wish we could get up in the morning and say, praise God, I'm saved. I claim $2 million in the morning. And it would happen. Now, can you imagine how we would be right now? But you have people that believe that all they got to do is just say that, and it happened. But see, Again, you got to narrow this thing down. He said, if you ask anything in my name. And people say, well, I did. I asked it in Jesus' name. No, he's not. See, we're talking position now. Saying his name don't mean you in his name. Using his name don't mean you in his name. When he say in my name, he means just that. If you ask anything in my name, because everything you're going to ask in his name is going to match up to his nature. He's not covetous. He's not greedy. So I can't go in there and pray in Lord in the name of Jesus. My neighbor just got a new car. Praise God. Bless me with a new car. That's covetous. <laughs> he can't honor that. And I may go get a car, but it doesn't mean that God blessed me with it. It means that I had good credit. And got alone. That's what that means. So my thing is, first of all, when he says, "Ye that labor and heavy laden, come unto me and rest," I noticed one thing in church since I've been in over forty some years now. People are always wore out spiritually. Oh man, I'm just so y'all pray for me, pray for my encouragement, pray that some I get encouraged. Pray for my strength. All the things we ask God to do for us, and a lot of these different prayer requests we have, uh, y'all pray that God give me strength. See, we can't give you strength. First thing you need to do is do what he told you to do. Come unto him first. You got to come to him first. First thing you need to do is come to him and sit down and rest. Yeah. You, you can't, but see, you're working for him, someone you haven't even learned. 
You, you're trying to do a work for someone that you don't really know. You don't have no idea. You don't know what you like. Rose petals or what? You have no idea because you haven't learned of it. We want to do something based upon somebody else's thoughts about what God. No. Come, learn of me. It's important that we learn of him. It's important that we spend the time to know him. Because we can be deceived without knowing him. And the greatest deception ever was is when, when you can get blinded to who he is in your life the versus what you're trying to do to earn to become who he's supposed to be in your life for free. And most people feel. I know being an independent American has its pluses and minus in my life. I like to be independent. I love to be independent. Fourth of July is one of my favorite holidays. <laughs> you know, I get to blow up everything. No. But I love the idea of having that American dream, pulled yourself up by your own bootstrap kind of stuff, you know, did it my way kind of mentality. And so it makes it kind of rough on you when you come to God because God's way is just not like ours. And then he'll turn around and he wants you to be dependent on him. That's good, but the, pace, the impatience that grips us, God's timing ain't always like ours. And so we want to, we feel like he's, don't know what time it is. Have you ever felt like that? God, do you see what's going on? Don't you see what time it is? As if he is blinded to everything that's happening. And yet, he calmly and assuredly be where he needs to be when he needs to be there. I look at all the trips he made in the Bible, and it will seem like he showed up too late. I know the lady who had about five or six husbands, she probably wondered why he didn't come the first time. <laughs> she probably said, where are you at, Jesus? I hear this six times and you finally showing up. Better late than never. But anyway, there's a lot of people, man at the, at the pool, 38 long years. Long time. That's a long time. But it seemed like God knew exactly what time to come, what time to be there. See, I, I, I see God knowing more about our time than we do, and he's even outside of time. He even created time, not for himself, but for you. We need time so we can count our days. And the Bible tells you, you know, use a little wisdom. Count your days. That's for us. God don't need time. Because he's eternal. He's divine. But he says, come, and I will give you rest. If there's anything that I had to understand more than anything else in all of this work, because I've really, from the day one, from the time that I came into the church, I have always believed in being gun whole getting the job done, making it happen. And I felt so much better about my worth because I had a resume. I can always, you know, among us people, I can always write, give them that resume, man, and this is what I've done, and this is what I've done here. I've done all this, and it looks good, you know, in case I need another job. I, I got a resume. I got, <laughs> I taught at least, over 200 some Bible studies. I, I could go down the list, you know, and just started writing off stuff, things that I've done. And the only sad part about everything that we do, the rewards are not really that great. They're really not. You, you do all that, and you'll not get the reward that you thought you should have got. 
because of everything you've done. But the little things that he does in my life, the lasting rewards for those things, over and over again. But me being who I was, I could not accept free salvation. There's got to be a catch to this. There ain't no such thing as free. I even hang up on people that call me and tell me they got something free for me. I hang up the phone. I don't even want them to talk to me because I've always felt like when they say free, there's a catch. So I got in God. And, of course, come freely, drink. It was free, but shortly thereafter, it cost me a lot. And it was cost me more because I was drinking his water, but I was trying to please the people. <laughs> Their tax on me was a greater than the free drink I was getting from God. But I felt like I needed to earn that. God, you don't know how bad I was. Do you know how bad Adam was? Do you know the baddest dude that was created? It wasn't Kelly Wilson. His name was Adam. There was nobody in all of creation that's been as bad as that dude has been. He, see, I didn't mess up a whole lot of people. He messed up everybody. You know what I'm saying? So nothing I'm ever going to do in this life can ever compare to what he done. And one thing, if we ever get up there and we have to lay out the report cards, I'm going to say, I ain't going to have my finger pointed just one. If it weren't for you, buddy, <laughs> it's you, not me. See, he, he the one. So here we are. Because, you know, we struggle. We struggle with how bad or little bad we are and not realizing that the worst one that ever was created was Adam himself. Because what he done to all of humankind could only be revoked by the second one. And then you, and then you have the audacity to want to lean back to your old man for salvation, and here you got this new man, new Jesus, who has saved you to the uttermost. All he has asked you to do was come and rest. Yeah, I know what you said, Brother Wilson, but what are we supposed to do? Rest. Yeah, I know the Bible say rest, but what does that mean? Rest. Now, why is it that when it comes to God, he tells you to rest? You can't. Because you feel like, man, I owe God so much for saving my soul. Don't get me wrong. That's why I'm thankful every day. I'm grateful every day. Why? Because of his salvation. But I already realized me thinking that somehow I'm ever going to be able to pay him back for that. I can't. Number one, I don't have enough blood. It will take life. It will take blood to pay him, and I don't have it, nor do you. There's no sacrifice you can offer God that could beat the sacrifice that's been offered for you. The blood of bulls and goats cannot ever remit sin for a human being. An animal is an animal. You are a human being. It's a life for life. And the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it takes a life for a life. And unless you can lay down your life and pick it back up, you can never, ever pay for your sin. Except one, one lamb. That's why they call him the Lamb of God. Why? It took a lamb. Just one. Not only did that lamb was sacrificed, but he satisfied. He satisfied everything God needed to be satisfied with a sin offering. 
that he would never, ever need to have another sacrifice. There's never, contrary to all these teachings out here about rebuilding temples in Jerusalem and having sacrifices and God going to visit, I doubt that very seriously. That wouldn't even make sense. If he already told you I got my perfect sacrifice, now why would you think you're going to regress and go back to something that never could save nobody from the start? Now, does that make sense? Why would he go take you back under something that could never save you? The Bible says the law could never produce faith. Without faith, do you know that most Christians do not believe that? They do not believe that. Because they'll say things like, well, I ain't got faith in God, but, you know, <laughs> he knows me. Yeah, he do, but he wants you to have faith. You got to have faith. You say, you, you know what? Faith is so scary. Faith is scary. I don't know of anything that upsets and shakes up my Kelly Wilson world like faith does. Because it always put me in a position that I don't want to be in. I like comfort. I don't like a lot of wilderness experience. You know, I like four-lane highways. Not them two. But faith always seemed to have no passing zones. Two-lane highway kind of action. Round the curves and stuff. You know, why can't God just wake up Wake me up and say, now, Kelly, here's what I want you to do at 1005. And tomorrow I want you to get up. You know, I'd, I'd have some reasons getting up and running. But I get up, I don't know exactly what that day's going to be. Went out one day, had two flat tires, two blowouts. He should have told me. He should have told me that day, that morning. Kelly, you're going to have two flats today. I would have got that fixed. But he didn't. He allowed me to have them two flats, walked almost a mile to home, in the heat, laying in the grass, bugs crawling on me. I guess that was not important that day. To, and he may have been trying to tell me, and I just want to listen. See, every now and then, God will speak to us in, in real subtle ways, and we we'll, won't hear him. But I, I, I feel like when he told us to enter into the rest, I believe he meant that. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, I read it before, but I got to bring it back again. Because I found that this, this here is really tripping more of the ministers up than I've ever seen in my life because the actually so it never was put in the book. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise been left us of entering into his rest, and of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, when he brought them out of Egypt, he was wanting to bring them where? Into rest. That's why he said, you remember how we quote the Bible, the, the battle's not yours? The Lord will fight your battle? That was in the promised land. In other words, this is where God wanted to position his people to be put in that place of rest where if he obeyed, they didn't have to fight. 99.9% .9 of Christians today saying they're still fighting because they're not positioned right. The position in God, spiritual promise, he does the fighting for you. Not only do you not fight, but he's going to show you Reveal to you what he's done for you. Wrestling with him is where revelation comes. Coming into his presence, living there is where revelation comes. It's where we behold his glory and are changed 
from glory to glory and from faith to faith. It's where we come to be changed. See, most people feel like, you know, we, we love to have what we call altar services, but altar service is not for change. A throne room experience is for change. On the thing, the altar is for its destruction, not construction. The throne room is for construction. It's for change. That's why the Bible says that when you have a need, or you, you got to come to the throne of grace and mercy to obtain help. We help people trying to get help at the altar, and the brazen altar is never there for your help. It's there for your destruction. Jesus has already made a way for you to come straight to him. That's why he talks about the way has been made. What way? The way into his presence. It ain't five songs and now we're in the presence of God. It ain't 15 minutes of dancing, now we're in the presence of God. No, we are to position ourselves to be in his presence. Because in his presence, there is what? Fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. <laughs> Our whole attitude should tell us where we're living, that in God. When it comes to things of God, oh, he said, they heard it. But what they didn't do was mix with it faith. And when they didn't mix faith, because when they heard it, their response to what they heard, they said, they got great big walls. And they got great big giants. So they didn't respond with faith. They believed in more what they saw that they couldn't do than what Jesus could do or God could do for them if they believed it. Because once they saw what was against them, they made excuses. They made excuses for their kids. And God literally had to let them walk to death to keep them from going in without faith. Because again, ain't God is not going to let you live in the promise without believing him too. You're not going to enjoy his promises and not have faith in him. So he wouldn't allow them to. Now he took care of them. And here's another thing we need to realize that there is a certain amount of glory no matter where you're at. If you're in the wilderness, there's a certain amount. Ain't a whole lot. It's fading because it's waiting on the next step of glory, but it's fading. Remember Moses went up, got the glory on him, but he knew it was a fading glory. It wasn't going to last there. You may have an exciting time walking around your mountains, but remember this, it's fading. The glory is fading. The only glory that you're going to see is the glory in the face of Jesus Christ in which what you behold is what you become. That's why when he talks about be ye holy for I am holy, well, you wouldn't know how to be holy without first beholding who he is. Beholding him, having him is what makes us holy. That's why they call him the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Why? That's God's holy. That's what makes us holy is him. People say what I'm trying to get the anointing. God is the anointed one, and he anoints all those that he calls. See, we don't have this tear, this uh, what I call the pyramid effect when it comes to God. There's not one person in God that can't come to him without a mediator. You don't need anybody's permission to talk to God. You don't need anybody going for you. You can do it. Why? because he made a way for you to. And you should take advantage of that every day that you can. So he says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest. 
although the works which were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. In other words, he goes through and tell you, it took him seven days to do all he done. He done everything he needed to do. And then, you know, we want to get real technical about, well, did God see this? God finished everything he would ever need to do for this creation. He finished it on his seventh day. Oh, Brother Wilson. I know you all been looking at the news and all that stuff. They tell you you're getting ready to run out of water. You know what? I don't believe we've lost not one drop of water since earth's been around. I believe the water he put here in the beginning is still here. The dirt he put here in the beginning is still here. And you say, well, and as much bricks we'd have made, but I don't think we put a dent in anything God put here on earth. Not one thing. The air, I don't think he ain't put no new atmosphere here. We got seven miles of air. This same air has been surrounding this earth for how many ever years it's been here. I ain't into that five hundred billion dollars or five hundred billion years stuff. I don't know how they know that. I ain't figured that out. But hey, I'm not here to argue because we both look like fools. The reason why we both look like fools trying to argue that? Because we don't know. And you know why we don't know? We wasn't there. Huh? You know what I'm saying? So it doesn't make no sense when we argue about how long earth has been here. But here I do believe that everything that God put from atmosphere, water, and everything that was vital to your existence, he hasn't had to change. Not one thing. He fixed his soul. Even you. You came up out of the earth. And guess what? When you leave, you leave your earth here. <laughs> you, you could be more, more fertilizer left behind. As simple as that. He got everything fixed where energy cannot be lost. It can only be changed. Everything is energized, goes back, and becomes more energy. You burn a tree down. It energizes the soil takes on a seed to grow another tree. So everything about God's creation kind of takes care of itself. So he said, I rested. In other words, I put everything in creation that was necessary. He didn't have to come back and redo anything. Didn't have to make new water. Man, that's why Jesus could come in and and move the process forward in turning water to wine. He omitted processing. Because where he lives, everything can be instant. In his position, in his place, everything can be instant. Down here, we're kind of like in time. That's why he says, I've made all things beautiful in my time. But in his eternity, everything has been made as is. That's why he will tell you, as he is, so are we. It's almost like one of them sci-fi kind of movies where you got, I guess they call it Matrix stuff, you know, or parallel universes. Sometimes I picture that in my mind. Now I'm walking down here on earth, but then there's something that's controlling things where I'm walking here on earth. That's why I believe in praising God, not because I'm in a building, I believe that when I praise God, when I'm by myself, it creates an atmosphere for me. I don't just say hallelujah when everybody say hallelujah. I want to be able to be in a position with God at all times where that I'm creating the atmosphere around me that I want to live in. You know, I, you can live in whatever you want to live in. I choose to live in this peace. So, in a way, he said, and again, in this place, again, if they shall enter my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some 
must enter their end, and they too won't be able to first preach in that end because of unbelief. So <laughs> that's only one way you can't get in, and that is unbelief. They, they could not believe no matter what God done. Some people say today, if I could just see God do a miracle, I'd believe. Do you know how many miracles these guys see? Man, they woke up one day, it was just like a movie. One day you got bugs coming in, you got frogs croaking at night, and you got water turning to blood. You got red sea pardon. And then you're telling me all you need to see is a miracle so you can believe. Well, they, how, what kind of miracle do you need to see? Because if they seen all that, and they still walked away with unbelief, I'm trying to figure out what one what do you think God needs to show you right now that will make you just step on in it? Because I've heard people say, man, if I could just see a miracle. You are a miracle. And if you ain't believed that you're one of the biggest miracles in this world, you are a miracle. If God saves you, you are a walking miracle. Do you know it's utterly impossible? The word of God talks about can, can an unclean thing or can a clean thing come out of an unclean thing? Do you know how hard that is for God to sanctify you, call you holy, and you see you got the same old stinking blood flowing through your veins? But yet, you know what he said? You holy. You mine. And it, you don't think that's a miracle? I, to me, every day I wake up, I feel like, man, I'm a walking miracle. Do you know how many people in your that you know has never had what you got, never experienced what you experienced, and then you can't, you don't have not one thing you can say for sure why he did it. I, I, I want to think that he thought I was a good-looking kid. I did do some good things for older people. I did. Not free, though, but I did. <laughs> and I want to think that because I respected my mom and them when I wasn't bad, that it counted for something. Have you ever looked at your life like that? You will say, well, and especially when you look out and you see these notorious people doing everything, and, you know, it almost makes you want to look at yourself and say, you know, well, God, I see why you saved me because, see, I ain't like them. <laughs> you ever feel like that? Yeah, you almost know that the reason why he kind of, because you're a good person. And, and you know, he saved you because, you know, I really was good people when I was coming up. I didn't do bad every day. And so, at least I didn't do as bad as John Rogers over here, Don, because he, he done been to prison five or six times. I, I didn't do nothing. But do you know God did not save me because of that? And I still don't have an answer, but I'm on one day. Well, I ain't going to even ask because you know why I know why he gonna, what he's going to tell me. See, because some of us think we're real special. And see, now I, I want to go in and have an audience with him and, and, and make believe that I'm real special. That's why he saved me and not some others that I know he didn't save. <laughs> nah. He going to tell me, you know the reason I saved you? Because I love you. And, you. and you know the reason why he saved all of us? Because he loved us. And, and, you know, and that's kind of hard because, see, I got my definition of love. I didn't get it from the Bible. Did you? And, and, and let me be honest now. So when you read the Bible and you read the word love and you see and God is love, what, what pops up in your mind, your, the definition that you have acquired? Because, you see, it's hard. It was hard for me to understand him loving, God love, and 
And, and, and I'm trying to fit that with the definition that I have of love. You know, trying to put God in that definition of love, and yet there is none. Do you know we really don't have real words that could really truly define the eternal God that we serve? Because everything that we try to define in time is limited with time. So when you tell me that God will love you forever, when I hear things like he will never leave you nor forsake you, see now, I kind of put him in time. Because I've, nev I've not known anything in time that was not capable of leaving me and forsaken me, even the things I love. But then I got to turn around and forget about comparing God to the things that I think I know because he's trying to introduce me to his definition. And when he talks about no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friend and then kind of find out I never considered myself when I was growing up a friend of God but yet he still laid down his life for me. So that's a miracle in itself. So I want to make sure that I'm not walking around in total unbelief because unbelief is what's keeping us from being rested. The unbelief is what's keeping us from seeing him fight for you instead of you fighting for yourself as you always have. Thinking that you whooping the devil when you get with him and you sit down with him, you're going to realize one thing. You got to see his triumph over your enemy, right? You're trying to see what you can do with your enemy, and you're losing every time. If you rest with him, he's going to show you what he done to your enemy. Many people are fighting when they don't have to fight if they only learn how to rest. But resting means that you're going to have to trust God. Resting means that you're going to have to give up you and really trust him. And a lot of times it's hard for us as human beings to accept help from God. The only time we really want God to help us, and it's the only time, is when it is totally impossible for us. But if we got one little ounce of hope, you know what we're going to do? We're going to squeeze everything we out. Anything but God. Please don't make me trust God. We'll try, man, I'll drink five glasses of Kool-Aid. <laughs> but please don't make me trust God. But see the whole thing about it? We got to trust God. And you know, what, you know what's really good? All you got to do is pray yourself. I don't fool myself. If I, if I know I got doubts, I just tell God, hey, you know, I, I, I know. I know it's possible, but you're going to help me. <laughs> you got to help me. You know I'm saying heal because unbelief becomes a sickness. So I, I need a healing. I need him to heal my unbelief. And uh, all these things we ask him, though, see, the way God has bringing about answers to us is not pleasant. Because he, if you heal your unbelief, that's really going to put you into a real bad place. You know what I'm saying? Because how are you going to know that you quit being in unbelief? <laughs> so that means that you probably have to get into some stuff. And it might mean that the first time you're in it, you might have to step back out and walk around the mountain again. But you'll be back. But when you come back the next time, you want to make sure that, again, God healed my unbelief. That's where I want to be. It's not like we don't have it because it's there. Our first recourse in anything most of the time is not to believe God but to be just the opposite. 
What can I do to help myself? And then when it don't work, then we need to go and, and start uh, putting God on the panic button. Lord, if you don't hear him do something, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I believe God just started laughing at him. I believe he gets happy every time you say stuff like that. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's just getting all happy. Thank you. <laughs> that laugh. And then after saying you don't know what you're going to do, you're still trying to do something. But after doing, after having done all, you should just say it. But we don't know what else we're going to do, but we're still trying to come up with new ideas. When you get to that place, why don't you just go ahead and say, okay, God, here I am. Here I am. I know you want to wave one hand at it. But you know one thing I like about the police, they want you to put both of them up. I mean, I say, I know. I've had a little experience with those guys. They like to see both hands. And when they see both hands, they know that you are fully surrendered. And then they ask you to get down on your knees. Uh-oh. Man, get on your knees, they say. And make sure you won't let your hand get in the way. Put them behind your head like this and clamp them together. That way you ain't going to do nothing crazy. I wonder if God been arresting us lately. I wonder if he said, put your hands up and get on your knees. <laughs> put your hands clamped. Get handcuffed. You know, Paul talked about it. He said, you know, when you talk about uh, I've been apprehended, you know, he, he didn't know what it apprehended him, but he'd been apprehended. He said, I've been arrested. So Paul understood that sometimes what's got us, we don't understand what has a hold of us, but we know we've been apprehended. We know we've been arrested. I think that's really good. So he said, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today after so long time is said, today you hear my voice. Oh, not your heart, for Jesus had given them rest, and he would not have to have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. There remain a rest. Now, I know in our zealousness and our teaching, man, wait till you go to heaven, you're finally going to rest. Jesus would have waited till you got to heaven if he just wanted you to rest there. He came to give you rest while you was here. Can you rest now in him? Because if he rested in heaven, you should be resting here, right? As he is. So are we. Where? When we get to heaven? No. Right here. Don't you think we need to have rest? I think we have literally killed ourselves in this because we won't allow God to be God. He can do more in five seconds than it takes me 40 years to do. Send one word, change your whole life. Just one word. You see, when he said come, you're going to find rest for your souls. How many people heard it but won't do it? If you come to me, you're going to find rest for your soul. And he wants you to rest. The peace we've been looking for. The battles we've been fighting. The defeats. Rarely victories. Because we usually end up one battle leads to another battle. And we spend the rest of our life just battling, battling. I'm battling this, I'm battling that. Well, you're battling day. I don't know. I'm battling depression. I'm battling this. I'm, I'm fighting this. You know, I, and, and I feel sorry for Christians who really have to fight depression because I realize that that is real too. And I've been there. But I realize all the things that we fight, our answers can only be found in Jesus. He's, he got the answer. There ain't no... If and buts about it. So 
here we are. We got wounded, battle wounds, scars, you name it. Some of us have been in a lot of tremendous battles. Been wounded in the world, wounded in the church, wounded all over. But yet Jesus says, I am going to make your enemy the footstool. Once again, he's talking about resting. You, your enemy can't be under your feet unless you're sitting down with Jesus. All the songs that we sing about putting the stumping on the devil, and I'm going to stump the devil's head, and I'm going to do all that. No. If you rest, he'll put them under your feet. That's his promise. Well, do you think it's that easy? You know, it's easy for me to read the Bible and look at these guys in the Bible and think how easy it was for them. Can you imagine Abraham getting up one morning and the Lord says, hey, I want you to check out here. Get, get away from all your kinfolk. Pack up and leave. See, I tried to put myself in that position. Now, I'm not saying that, well, Abraham was a heathen. He was an idolatrous man. He worshipped whatever was being worshipped in that day. But one day he gets this word, says, I want you to leave. And I don't think that we have that kind of confidence in God like that, do we? Because if he was to tell me something like that, he would have to show me verse in Scripture, chapter and verse. You know what I'm saying? Would, would, would he have to do you? Would, would he have to show you chapter and verse? That's what I'm trying to figure out. How did these guys, without a chapter and verse, could be so obedient? We got chapter and verse. And the Holy Ghost. And we don't even intend to do any of that. So how, what is it about these people that God could tell them something and they'd act on it, walk out not knowing, you, you know, it, it's scary enough just riding down the highway, but you're talking about going through the woods and things. No highway six. Just walking and hoping you hear God, right, so you make sure you show up the right place. He ain't told you where you're going. He said, I want you to get up and go. I'll show you. See, I like to, when I leave home, I like to have my GPS already programmed. So it knows exactly where I'm going. God doesn't use that type of stuff in our life. Because faith is always one step away. Huh? You, you want them to paint out the whole plan, don't you? Right? So when I do take the first step, I know where the next one is. That's not God. He don't operate like that. Abraham went and spent about 15 years before he heard from God again. Could we last that long or record it? He, he, he may have been talking to him every day. I don't know, but it didn't seem like it. It seemed like in, in the recording of the story, it was 15 years between the time he told him to leave to the time he talked to him again. And here you are out of here about to lose your mind. You don't left your house, left the kinfolks, left everything, left your country in a foreign land. Will you question whether or not you heard God or not? Will you have kind of like think about going back because God done messed up? I thought I heard God, but it wasn't God. And I've heard people say that God spoke to me and God will speak, but then we'll interpret what we think the speech was for. Wrong deal. Wrong deal. 
Man, when God first spoke to me, I thought I knew too. I told him, man, thank you, Jesus. I'm getting ready to go and be an evangelist. Preach one week. Preach the whole week. And I realized then, I was not called to preach every night like that. It took too much out of me. I like to travel. Because I told God, I said, I know this is what you're doing. Because, see, I, you know, he wasn't talking that much. He was just trying to get me stirred up. And I was trying to help him out. I said, now, I know why you called me. You know I like to travel. And you're trying to give me a ministry that's going to let me travel. So the only one I know that does that is an evangelist. So I'm an evangelist. But I never had that type of ministry. See, the evangelist would come in and everybody get to jumping. And he had people run all around the place, man. I'd get up, say something real sober light. Ain't nobody shouted or nothing. I used to have a complex. I said, God, why don't you give me something like you give them a guy? Make them jump and shout. He never gave me any of that. So I realized if I was going to be an evangelist, I need to get some catchphrases. I, I needed to get some things that turn them buttons. So I started listening to someone. I went and tried out one night. I said, get ready, get ready, get ready. They'd heard that before. I could see they getting ready, too. They got up like, ah! I said, man, I got the words now. Get ready, get ready. No. But God didn't give me that. I wanted him to give me that. But that's not what he had for me. Just like a lot of us today, we have no idea what God really wants to do in our lives. And if you're not careful, you're going to look at someone else and think that maybe I ought to do that. It may be just one. You may be the little girl in, in, in Naaman's house. You, you, you may be some unknown person. No one ever knows because today, you know, everybody got, got to have that 15 minutes of fame, tiktok it and all that kind of stuff. We got to have that. No. Just know this, when you're in the purpose of God, you're in the purpose of God. You're going to discover your purpose when you discover your rest. Until you discover how to rest in God, you will never find the purpose at all. You will never find it. Some of us have found it impossible <laughs> to even live according to the word. Even what we read is impossible to live it. We're struggling even with knowing what the Bible says and still can't do what the Bible says. So yeah, even that has caused us a lot of depressed thoughts, uh, failure, feeling the failure. Uh, somehow we just cannot seem to get everything connected. You know what I'm saying? It's like we know the Bible says it. We know the Bible said have faith, but we know we can't. Or we say we can't. We talk ourselves out of more of the promise of God than we need to. Because first thing, we, we, it's hard for me. We want everything defined. We want people to define faith for us. We want, what is faith? Well, faith is some sort of things, not hope of things, not seen, all that. But what is it? You know what I'm saying? We, we'll sit there and blurt that out, man. People quote it back to back. But then what is it, though? So we need to know what it is. And so when we come to God, we read these things, uh, and then we want to incorporate them into our life, but it's impossible because we really have sat down with Jesus and rested with him so he can tell us. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. Can we trust the Holy Ghost? You see, most of the time we're trying to reenact the Bible 
and the Holy Ghost is leading you, and we, but we want him to do what he done back here. This is not all he done. The Bible doesn't hold everything Jesus done. Did not the scripture tell you that if the books had been written on the things that he done while he was here, we didn't have a big enough library to hold them? So this is our starter. But we still got to know him as much as we know this. If this Bible is ever going to make sense to us, God has to make sense to us first. That has to happen. If he doesn't make sense to you, this ain't going to make sense. Because you're going to go and try to figure out how God is not in reading the Bible. Well, I don't believe God do this anymore. I have people tell me all the time, well, God don't do miracles. He don't do signs. We need to see signs and wonders. I don't need to see not a one. I don't need to see not a one. The Bible says those that seek out the sign, there's an adulterous generation. Always seeking a sign. I don't need a sign. I got all the sign I need right now. Uh, he done convinced me. I don't need lightning coming out of heaven. I, I don't need the waters parting out on Lake Decatur. If I never seen that, well, why won't God do it now? Because God is not trying to operate on, on your doubts and fears. Faith is what moves God. If you got a little bit of faith, it's better than no faith at all. Praise God. So, labor to enter into his rest. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I think I'm going to close here just a minute. I don't want to get to. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'll be here all night. But let's, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, 32. None of these things you don't know. But I keep reiterating them again because everybody wants something totally different. They want a home run without coming to the plate and bat. You know what I'm saying? They, they, everybody wants to get a touchdown without getting on the field. Everybody wants a victory without ever having a battle. So, I mean, that's the kind of world we live in is that we want all the things that God has, but we don't want to step up to the plate. I believe there, there are dots to be connected. I don't think any of us is greater than anybody. I believe that God's faith works for everybody the same way. But I think we've got to put those dots together. There are certain things I think that has to happen. Got to have faith. We know that. You, you can't even get around that because without faith, we ain't going nowhere. Can't even get off, we can't even get out the dugout. But faith will at least take you to the first plate, take you on around. Faith will bring you all the way home, but you got to keep believing. Faith is not something you started one time. You know, some of us say, well, I, I, I had faith in Jesus 25 years ago. That faith should be growing every day. It's the only thing I know in, in church where it gets weaker as we get older. We come in. I know I was crazy. I was plumb stupid. Because if you told me a story about believing God, I trusted it. I, man, they had me so excited. They would tell me about how they would pray for meal barrels and in the depression and the meal barrels would stay full. I excited me. They would tell me about how they would pray and things would happen. That excited me. So I come in wanting to see these things, desiring to see these things, wanting to believe. But the more we begin to know, our knowledge kills our faith. A lot, the wrong knowledge does. Because all we got to do is see one incident where it didn't work. That don't bolster to anybody's faith. So first thing we say, well, you know, I had to fight around. God gave us common sense. 
That's what got us all killed was common sense. Because it was common sense to eat a fruit that looked good for food. <laughs> Any question, I'm going to let you go. I'm thinking next Thursday night we probably, believe it or not, I got to go out of town again. Probably next Thursday. So, I don't know about Sunday. You know, one thing Jesus made very plain, they didn't want to pay taxes. I'm hoping God let me go fishing this week. I just, I just want, I'm listening for him to tell me just where the fish is that I need to catch. 